Hi everyone, thanks for joining me today. So today's talk is going to be on some topics in number theory. Now number theory is a huge field and it's not at all my specialty, but there are a few particular aspects of number theory that appear in dynamical systems and I found out about them when I was a student and I found them quite fascinating. So this is what I'm going to talk about today. So let me start with a way of representing real numbers. So let me take a number x in R. Now we all know about decimal or binary or other expansions, but there is another way of representing x which will be useful. So first of all, let me write floor x like this for the integer part of x. So that will be the largest integer, so the max of all k and z, such that k is less or equal x. So this is the integer part. And then let me write x in curly brackets for x minus its integer part. And that will be between 0 and 1, where 1 is excluded. That is what we call the fractional part. So any real number can be decomposed into its integer and fractional parts. Now, let me do the following thing. So let me start with my real number x. And on the one hand, I compute its integer part. And let me denote this by a0. And then if the fractional part is not 0, I can take its inverse. So here I take 1 over the fractional part and I get some number, and this will be strictly larger than one. So what I can do now is I can again decompose this, so take the integer part and get a number a1, and if this uh, one over fractional part of x is, uh, is not an integer, I can keep applying the inverse of the fractional part and so on. So I keep doing this as long as I can, so as long as I don't end up with an integer. And the fact is that these integers a0, a1 and so on actually determine the number x. So let us look at a couple of examples. So my first example will be x is 13 over 8. All right, so first of all, 13 over 8, that is between 1 and 2, so the integer part will be 1. And then the fractional part, that is 13 over 8 minus 1, that is 5 over 8, I take the inverse, that gives me 8 over 5. Okay, so since this is non-zero, I can, I can keep going, so the integer part of 8 over 5, that's again 1. The fractional part is 3 over 5. I take the inverse, I get 5 over 3. And then the integer part is again 1. Fractional part 2 over 3, the inverse is 3 over 2, which has integer part 1. And fractional part 1 over 2, that gives me 2. And now here I have an integer part which is 2 and the fractional part is 0, so I stop here. So you see what I've done here is that I have written 13 over 8 uh, as the following thing. So it's 1 plus 1 over, well, 8 over 5, which is 1 plus 1 over, uh, and so on. So if I hope I don't make a mistake in counting the number of ones, I get something like this. So, so this is an example of a continued fraction. 
And since it is uh, a bit cumbersome to, to write these uh, fractions, let me introduce a notation. So let me say that 13 over 8 is equal to 1, 1, 1, 1, I have four ones followed by two. So which is just the sequence of integers I have down here. Let me give a second example, which is a more complicated fraction, which is 355 over 113. So now the integer part, well, that is actually, I have to make a Euclidean division, and I see that I can fit 113 three times into 355. 3 times 113, that is 339, so the remainder is 16. So the fractional part is 16 over 113, and the inverse is 113 over 16. And now you check that actually I, you can put 7 times 16 in 113, that gives 112. So the remainder is 1 over 16, and this, so the inverse is 16. And then again we get 16 and we stop. So this means that 355 over 113, that looked like a more complicated fraction, has actually a rather short continued fraction expansion, which is 3716. So why is this type of decomposition of numbers useful? Well, we will see some examples, but one particular point is that actually they, you know, decimal expansions or binary expansions, or if you use some other base, that is quite arbitrary. It depends on the base you choose. While this procedure here is actually uh, completely independent of any choice of bases. Now, uh, one question one can ask is, is this continued fraction expansion unique? And, well, the algorithm I present here, for, at least for rational numbers, is indeed unique, but it may be that two different expansions here in square brackets have the same value, and actually uh, that is true because, you see here, I have uh, this 16, I can actually write it as 15 plus 1 over 1. So my expansion here, I can also write it as 3, 7, 15, 1. So the point is that if I have a sequence a naught to a n, I will, and a n uh, will be by construction a strictly, uh, strictly positive integer, that will be the same as a naught a n minus 1, 1. But apart from that, my construction is indeed unique. So now I gave here examples with uh, rational numbers, but how about irrational numbers? Well, the interesting result here is that actually a real number x has a finite continued fraction expansion if and only if it is irrational. In other words, irrational x will always have infinite continued fraction expansions. So this is not hard to show, so let's look at the proof. So it's an equivalent, so let me prove both directions. So the first direction is I assume that x has a finite expansion, and I want to show it that it is rational. So let me write x as some a0, etc., up to a n. And now the point is that actually by definition of my continued fraction, this means that x is equal to a0 plus 1 divided by the expansion a1 up to a n. And this shows that I can actually give a proof by induction, because if x has only one uh, 
let's say I, I take this number here, just a n, well, that will be the integer a n, so it's an integer, in particular it's rational. And then I can just proceed by induction on the number of digits I take. So after that, you see that a n minus 1 a n, that's a n plus the inverse of uh, of an integer, so it's a rational number, and then by induction I get the result. And in the other direction, what I have to show is that if x is a fraction, so it's p over q, where p and q are integers, then my I want to show that my algorithm stops. So let us compute the fractional part of x. Well, that will be given by p mod q over q, right? And uh, so that is just Euclidean division. The numerator is the remainder by the Euclidean division. And the inverse will be equal to q over p mod q. And the point here is that the denominator here is always strictly smaller than q. And this means that in my procedure I will have fractions with smaller and smaller denominator, so at one point I have to reach an integer. So it's exactly the same argument as for, uh, the, for Euclid's algorithm when you compute the greatest common divisor. Right, so let's now look at some examples. So what do we know as uh, irrational numbers? Well, for instance, we know that square root of 2 is irrational. So, and since 2 is strictly between 1 and 4, that tells me that square root of 2 is strictly between 1 and 2. And therefore, the integer part of square root of 2 is, of course, 1. So I can write, so integer part of x is 1. Therefore, the fractional part of x is equal to square root of 2 minus 1. And now I have to compute its inverse. So let's compute 1 over square root of 2 minus 1. Now, when working with square roots, we learn that a good thing in order to evaluate such an expression is to amplify the fraction by its conjugate. So I multiply the numerator and the denominator by square root of 2 plus 1. And the denominator here well, that is a minus b times a plus b, which is a square minus b square. So that is equal to 2 minus 1, which is 1. That is convenient, because then I just get square root of 2 plus 1. And so you see I'm, I'm back at uh, something related to square root of 2. And this means that in my algorithm, starting with square root of 2, so the first integer part is 1, then I get square root of 2 plus 1. And here I know that the integer part is 2. And then what happens? So the fractional part is again square root of 2 minus 1. But the inverse of that, I know, I've just computed, is square root of 2 plus 1. So again, the integer part is 2. And I get again square root of 2 plus 1. So therefore, the continued fraction expansion of square root of 2 is 1, 2, 2, 2, and I have an infinite sequence of 2s. So this is a rather nice observation. So I have here an example of a periodic or eventually periodic continued fraction expansion. Now another Irrational number we know is pi. So pi 
at this approximately 3.1415926. So therefore, the integer part is 2. Now for pi, we don't have such a nice way of computing the inverse or the inverse of the fractional part, but we can do it with a calculator, at least hoping that it is precise enough. So the fractional part here is about uh, 0 0.1415 and so on. And if I compute the inverse of that, I get 7.06251, etc. So the integer part of that is 7. And you see here, uh, I have a rather small fractional part. And if I do the computation, I find uh, 15. Point nine nine six five nine four something like that so the integer part is now 15 and the fractional part now is very close to one and if i compute its inverse i get 0 0.003417 so integer part 1. And at the next step, now you see I have a very small fractional part, so I will get a large inverse. So I actually get 292.6349 and so on. So the next number here is 292. And uh, okay, the next number, if you do the computation, will be 1 again. So what I find here is that pi is equal, has a continued fraction expansion given by 3, 7, 15, 1, 292, 1, and then it continues with a bunch of 1s and so on. So here there is no discernible pattern. The digits seem pretty random and also you have this 292, which is very large, and then so you, we have both uh, small and large digits. And as far as we know, there's no particular pattern in the expansion of pi. So we have seen here two examples. In one example, the continued fraction expansion is ultimately periodic. In the other case, it does not seem to be periodic. I mean, after the one here, it doesn't stay one forever. So we could ask, what uh, is the link? Uh, what numbers uh, have eventually periodic and not periodic continued fraction? Well, there's a result by Lagrange saying that a real number has an eventually periodic continued fraction expansion if and only if it is a quadratic equational. So what is a quadratic equational? So I mentioned that in, in another talk on the kolmogorov arnold moser theorem. So we say that an irrational number x is algebraic if there exists a polynomial p with integer coefficients such that p of x is equal to 0. And in particular, if p has degree 2, then we say that uh, x is quadratic. And an irrational number that is not algebraic is called transcendental. So let us look again at uh, some examples. So for instance, x so we have already talked about square root of 2. What happens, for instance, if I take 1, 1, 1, repeating an infinite number of times? So in that case, well, you see x has the form 1 plus 1 over 1 plus 1 over 1, etc. And this shows that x satisfies the equation x equals 1 plus 1 over x. And this I can solve because if I multiply this by x, I get x squared minus x 
minus 1 equals 0. And uh, if I solve, I find two solutions, but uh, the one which has the correct sign is 1 plus square root of 5 over 2. And that is nothing but the golden ratio or golden mean. So here's another nice example of a quadratic algebraic number which has a periodic continued fraction expansion. And more generally, I can look at expansions of the form n, 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 and so on. And then I get the equation x is equal to n plus 1 over x. And that gives me x squared minus nx minus 1 equals 0. And uh, I can solve this. So it gives me x is equal to n plus square root of n squared plus 4 over 2. So this illustrates this theorem by Lagrange in the case of uh, periodic. In fact, we have found that it works for periodic expansions. Now, it is not so hard to extend this to uh, expansions that have a longer period. So if, uh, an example would be x is equal to 1, 2, 1, 2, repeating. And then you see I get an equation of the form x is 1 plus 1 over 2 plus 1 over x. And you can again simplify this equation and you find again a quadratic equation. And uh, if I'm not mistaken, this leads to x is 1 plus square root of 3 over 2. You can check that. Now, for these uh, reasons here, you can actually figure out that whenever you have a periodic continued fraction, then if you write an equation like this, you can always simplify it to something which is a, an equation of degree 2, so you get indeed a quadratic equation. And if it is eventually periodic, meaning that you have some digits at the beginning and then it becomes periodic after a while, it's the same argument because you just take the periodic part and then you apply a few times this link between uh, so expansions of length uh, n minus 1 and n, and you find again something rational. So in this way, we understand one direction. So we understand that every eventually periodic continued fraction corresponds to a quadratic irrational. Now, the other direction is a little bit more difficult, and I'm not going to give a proof of that, but I'm going to give you a tool which is important for for that, and it's the notion of convergent. So let us assume that x is irrational and it has a certain continued fraction expansion, which is infinite, a not a1, and so on. Then I will call convergent the finite expansion that stops at the coefficient a n, which I know is a rational number. And given this uh, sequence, a not a1 and so on, I can actually compute these convergence. So it's easy to check, you just write the, the relations that xn will be of the form pn over qn where we have a certain uh, in, some initial values, so for p0, q0, p1, q1, and then we have these recursive formulas here for pn and qn. So let me take an example. So let me go back to this golden ratio, which has an expansion of 1, 1, 1, and so on. So what are the convergence? So 
so a naught will be one so p naught is one q naught is one so the first convergent is one over one and if i compute p1 that will be one times one plus one that is two and q1 is again one and then you see i just add the numerators and denominators of the two previous terms so one plus two that is three one plus one that is two then two plus three that is five one plus two that is three and so on so I get again this uh, 13 over 8 I had before. And what you observe here is if you look at both the numerators and the denominators, 1, 1, 2, 3, 5, 8, well, these are the Fibonacci numbers. And that is an immediate consequence of this relation here because I know that uh, the Fibonacci numbers are defined by this recursive relation. So Fn is Fn minus 1 plus Fn minus 2, starting with 1 and 1. And another example would be pi, which, as we have seen, is given by 3, 7, 15, 1, 292, etc. So if you do apply again this theorem what you find is that the first convergent is 3 over 1 then you get 22 over 7 which is a well-known fractional approximation of pi then you get 333 over 106 and then 355 over 113 that was actually one of my examples before and so on and in particular the second and fourth fractions here are very good approximations of pi for a given denominator. And in some sense, they are actually the best possible. And the reason why this 355 over 113 is such a good approximation is thanks to the 292 here, because if I truncate my uh, expansion, I truncate something of order 1 over 292, which is quite small. So now to be more precise, what I'm saying here, actually what you can show using these, uh, these relations and some, some similar relations is that the, uh, you can uh, bound above and below the difference between x and its convergence and it decreases like 1 over qn qn plus 1. So that is quite a fast decrease typically because the qn's will grow or well they they will grow exponentially in fact due to uh, to these uh, relations here. And what you can show is that xn is actually the best fraction with denominator less or equal qn that approximates x. So of course it doesn't make sense to say that I have the best fractional expansion uh, or approximation because I can always get better approximations. And if I have a sequence that converges to x, I can always dilute the sequence, take fewer and fewer terms, and it will converge more quickly. But if you fix the size of the denominator, actually this, this convergence will give the best approximations given that denominator. Now, this relation actually reminds us of something I've also talked about in my previous talk on the kolmogorov arnold moser theorem, which is Diophantine numbers. So let me recall that uh, an irrational number x is called Diophantine of type C nu, where C is some positive real number and nu is a real number larger equal one. 
if I have the following relation here saying that for any fraction p over q, so p and q are integers which are co-prime, so their greatest common, common divisor is 1. So the difference between x and p over q should be larger than this constant c divided by q to the 1 plus mu. And in particular, if mu is equal to 1, we say that x is of constant type. And one can see that that is actually the best one can hope for. So the smaller nu, the, you see the larger the right hand side here will be. So it will decrease more slowly if nu is small. So Diophantai numbers are numbers which are hard to approximate by rationals. Now, another thing I said in this previous lecture is I stated and actually proved this theorem by Uville that says that if x is an algebraic number, so here we have algebraic numbers again, and p is the polynomial that, uh, such that p of x is equal to zero, then actually x is diophantine with a certain value of nu here, and the value of nu is related to the degree of the polynomial and the number of derivatives of p that vanish at point x. And in particular, for quadratic equations, you see for quadratic equations we have n equals 2, p has degree 2, and we can take k equals 0 because the second derivative of my polynomial of degree 2 will be a constant and it has to be different from 0. And then I get here that nu is equal to 2 over 1 minus 1, which is equal to 1. So indeed, my quadratic irrational will be of constant type. Right, so now there's a slightly different way of expressing uh, this definition, which is to talk about what is called the irrationality measure. So here is the definition. So the irrationality measure is the smallest real number mu such that this difference x minus p over q is larger than 1 over q to the power mu plus epsilon for uh, any positive epsilon and sufficiently large p and q. So the link with the previous definition is that mu is somehow the smallest value you can take for nu, but that you may not be quite able to, to reach. So it's, it means you may not be able to take exactly mu as an exponent, but any exponent strictly larger than nu will do. And in fact, you can relate this, uh, this irrationality measure to the convergence. And you can also relate it to the continued fraction expansion itself. So here's a result by, by Sondo that says that you can obtain mu as a certain limit uh, superior of quantities related to the denominators in the convergence. And that is related to the, uh, this result we had before on the approximation of x by its convergence. Now, there is another result, and uh, that is a very difficult, very powerful, very strong result by Roth, saying that algebraic equations actually have irrationality measure 2. So it means that I can take actually any nu which is strictly larger than 1. 
I may not be able to take one, but I can take any strictly large allele. So there's another case which is very interesting, which is the case of E, so the Napier's number, the basis of, uh, of the exponential. And this I found quite surprising the first time I saw that. Actually, you can compute the continued fraction of E. And that was found for the first time by Euler. And actually, the continued fraction of E has the following form. So it starts with 2, 1, and then you have 2, 1, 1, 4, 1, 1, 6, 1, 1, etc. So you will have always uh, even numbers followed by 1, 1. So in particular, by the theorem by Lagrange I mentioned before, you see that this continued fraction is not eventually periodic. So E is a non-quadratic irrational. And in fact, it was shown later that E is a transcendental number, so it is not algebraic at all. So how did people obtain that? Well, Euler did something quite re remarkable. Uh, he took some kind of detour to find that. So he observed that the following function q of p, which is relate related to exponential of 2p over a, a being a parameter, satisfies a certain differential equation, which is known as a Riccati equation. And he had observed that this will this equation actually has a solution that you can give in terms of continued fractions that will involve the parameters a and p. And then you take special values of a and p and uh, you get this result. There's also a later proof by Hermit that uses the induction relation on convergence because Remember, we had this, these relations with the Pn and Qn, and we found a certain way of constructing them inductively. And since here we have explicitly the values of the An, we can compute the Pn and the Qn. And Hermit showed that actually these Pn and Qn satisfy the required relations, and that is due to some integral expressions that are related to a theory called Pade approximants. Now, so as I mentioned here, E is transcendental. One could ask whether it is Diophantine or, or not. And actually, uh, another non-trivial result is that E is actually Diophantine of type C nu for any nu larger strictly than one, as would be the case if it were uh, algebraic. But you see here, we, we know that uh, it is transcendental. And this you can obtain, for instance, by this result I just mentioned uh, before by Sondo. Right, so now in case you, you are lost with all these uh, definitions of uh, different types of irrational numbers, here is uh, a little summary. So we have here the set of all irrational numbers, and I've given a few examples here. So the first thing we did is to say that among these irrational numbers, we have algebraic numbers. And those that are not algebraic are called transcendental. And among the algebraic numbers, we have uh, the quadratic numbers, which are a special case, and this includes square root of 2 and the golden ratio. And an, uh, an example of uh, an algebraic number which is not quadratic would be 2 to the power 1 third because it solves x to the 3 minus 2 equals 0. 
And I also said that E is transcendental, it's not algebraic. And then and the other thing we saw was Diophantine numbers. So algebraic numbers are Diophantine, but there are Diophantine numbers like E, which are not algebraic. And a particular case of Diophantine numbers is those which have constant type. And quadratic algebraic numbers are of constant type. Now, I gave some examples here, but I, I didn't uh, put examples everywhere, and it's not so easy for some cases to, to give examples. For instance, uh, yeah, one, uh, one more thing I wanted to say is that phi uh, is actually what we call a noble number, so it's even more specific. So noble numbers are those whose continued fraction expansion at some point uh, has only ones. So that's of course the case for phi, but any continued fraction expansion that ultimately has only ones is called noble. So these are very particular equations, but at the same time they are dense, the equations, because I can take any fraction, for instance, uh, or any finite continued fraction expansion, and then append an infinity of ones, and it will give me a noble number. But now, how about pi, for instance? Well, pi, we know it has been proved that pi uh, is transcendental, so it's not algebraic. Uh, but as far as I know, uh, we don't know whether it is Diophantine or not. So because we have this 292, one could expect that it's actually quite well approximated by uh, rationals, but okay, as far as I know, uh, it could also be the case that pi is, is actually here. So I didn't find any reference or, on that. If anybody knows, uh, please let me know in the comments. But we have examples of non-diophantine transcendental numbers. So for instance, this is an example given by Liouville. This is a number which, so its decimal expansion has lots of zeros. So it's something like 0 0.1 and then you have a bunch of zeros and a one and more zeros and a one and more and more zeros. So you can somehow see that it is very well approximated by rational, so it's not diophantine. Right, so now there is one more topic I want to talk about. And to define that, let me start with a, a certain operation on fractions, on rational numbers. So let me assume that x is a over b and y equals c over d are some rationals. And so a, b, c, d are integers and uh, b and d are different from zero. And let me also assume that these uh, fractions here are in irreducible form. So a and b are co-prime, c and d are co-prime. And let me define a uh, a new rational number z, which is given by a plus c over b plus b. So what can we know, what can we say about this z here? Well, the first thing, as you know, is that z will be, in general, different from x plus y. There are very specific cases for a, b, c, d, where actually it is equal to the sum, but in general, this is not true. However, it may still have interesting properties. So let me just make up a notation. Let me use this plus in a box for z. And so a uh, first observation is the following. So what happens if x is equal to y? 
well, that is a over b, so a plus a over b plus b, that is 2a over 2b, that is a over b, so it's equal to x. So x composed with x in this way is actually equal to x itself. Now, my claim here is that this x composed with y is between x and y. So it will always be a number between x and y. And let us prove that. So I can always assume for definiteness that x is strictly smaller than y because x equals y we have already treated, it is true, and uh, if x is larger than y, I just swap the rows of x and y. And I can always assume that b and d are positive, strictly. So what I have is that a over b is smaller than c over d. And that means that a times d is strictly smaller than b times c. And now, so what I want to show is that z is larger than x and smaller than y. So let me compute z minus x. So that is a plus c over b plus d minus a over b. Okay, now I put this uh, under the same denominator. So that's a plus c times b minus a times b plus d divided by b times b plus d. But now I can simplify the numerator because I have ab minus ab and what remains is bc minus ad divided by b times b plus d. And this you see uh, is positive because ad is smaller than bc. And in the same way y minus z, you do a similar computation, you will find that it is negative. So this proves my little claim here. So what can we do with that? Well, let us take the case where we start like here with zero and one for x and y. So 0 I write as 0 over 1, 1 I write as 1 over 1. And then let me compute this modified sum. So that will be, would be a 0 plus 1 over 1 plus 1, that is 1 half. And now let me do the same again between the left 2 and the right numbers. So between 0 over 1 and 1 over 2, I will have 1 over 3. And on the other side, I will have 2 over 3. And now I keep doing this. So every time I compose two neighbors here, when I arrange them horizontally, so I get these fractions here, 1 over 4, 2 over 5, 3 over 5, 3 over 4, and so on. Now, this is called the fairy tree. So why is it a tree? Well, if I discard many of these, uh, these different edges, here is my fairy tree. And this tree has interesting properties, which are related to what we saw before. So, well, in particular, you see that here I have the sequence that converges to the golden ratio, 1 over 1, 1 over 2, 2 over 3, 3 over 5, 5 over 8, and so on, involving Fibonacci numbers. And you see that it has a specific path here on the tree. Now, uh, another thing we can ask is, how about continued fractions? So let us just compute a few 
continued fractions here. So let me just start with some examples. So for instance, 1 over 2, that is given by, so the integer part is 0, and then the fractional part is 1 half, its inverse is 2. Zero, uh, 1 over 3, that is easy, uh, also it is 0, 3. 1 over 4, it's 0, 4. 1 over 5 is 0, 5. Okay, but how about 2 thirds? So 2 thirds, the integer part is 0, then the fractional part is 2 thirds, the inverse is 3 over 2, it has integer part 1, and I'm left with a 1 half, and the inverse is 2. So if we do that for these numbers here, we get the following structure. Now, here you see, uh, if you stare at this tree for a while, you will recognize some patterns. So for instance here, uh, 0, 2, 0, 3, 0, 4, 0, 5, I just add 1 to the last uh, number. But something else happens, for instance here, I go from 0, 2 to 0, 1, 2. Now here again I increase the last digit, but here something different happens. So what happens in the case where I don't increase the last digit is that actually I have one more digit and that digit is always two. Now another thing you can see on this tree is that if I look at horizontal lines here I have zero plus two which is equal to two. Here I have zero plus three is zero plus one plus two equals three. And here I will al always have 4, here I will always have 5. So in each level of my tree, the number of the digits in the continued fraction is constant. So now what happens is actually this. So I have two types of links, so the purple and the orange ones. And what happens I is this, if I have a continued fraction 0, a1 up to a n. Now this we have seen we can also write as I go up to a n minus 1 but then I add 1. And then I do two things. So the, the purple thing here is uh, to change the 1 in 2. So I have a n minus 1 and I have 2. And the orange links here are those where I just add 1 to the last digit. And you can check on this tree that is exactly what happens with the orange and purple links. So we have actually a uh, precise rule to construct a fairy tree for continued fractions. And another thing you can note here is that on this branch we always have a1 equal 1. On this branch here we have a1 equals 2. Here we have a1 equals 3 and so on. And this actually implies that if we know the continued fraction expansion we know the path in the tree. So we know that if a1 is 1, we will have to make a right turn here. And then uh, depending on, on the values of the a's, we may have to take several steps. So for instance, the approximants of square root of 2 minus 1, which is given by 0, 2, 2, 2, 2. So they appear here, so we have 0, 2 here, and that, then we have 0, 2, 2 here, and so on. So we actually have two steps here because of the 2 here. So there's a precise rule on how you move in the fairy tree depending on the continued fraction expansion. 
So let me show you just a few other nice properties of this fairy tree. So here's a geometric construction. You can actually compute the fractions in the fairy tree in a geometric way, starting with a square of side length one. You plot the diagonals and you, you get one half here just by drawing a vertical under the intersection of the diagonals. And then what you do is that you connect one half to the top corners of the square, look at the intersections with the diagonals, and you will find that they are actually at locations one third and two thirds, which is the second floor in my fairy tree, the second level. And then if I draw a zigzag line like this, starting here in one third, two third, and connecting them to the corners and to the middle point of the square, I will get the next level, one quarter, two fifths, and so on, and so on and so forth. So there's a geometric construction behind it, and what happens is that at each stage, if you look at this quadrilateral here, actually the intersection of its diagonals will give the next point in the fairy tree. Here is a, another nice geometrical construction that uses these uh, lines I've drawn before, but there are many more lines, and it is related to so-called fault circles. So what is a fault circle? It has a center at coordinates p over q, 1 over 2q squared, and it has a radius given by 1 over 2q squared. So for instance, here I have the fault circle for one half. Uh, that's the big circle here. And then here I have the next circles at one third and two third. And they are tangent to the first fault circle. And actually all the circles here by decreasing size will be directly connected to the fractions in the fairy tree. Now there are more circles here. The circles up here are not fault circles, but they are related to the fault circles. So this shows you that you have a lot of geometrical structure related to these uh, fractions in the fairy tree. So I said that actually these properties from number theory are important in dynamical systems and why is that the case? So a first example I talked about in the previous lecture, it's this kolmogorov arnold moser theory. And the main result in this theory uh, says approximately the following thing. If I have a, an integrable dynamical system, which is like a rotation, and its rotation number is a diophantine number, then it will survive sufficiently small perturbations. So Diophantine numbers are important in the theory of perturbation of certain dynamical systems. So there's another nice link with synchronization and phase locking, where actually the fairy tree appears, and I plan to talk about that in, in another lecture. But there are many more relations, and uh, for instance, there are also relations to complex dynamics, holomorphic dynamics, which is what plays a role, for instance, in uh, the Mandelbrot set and Julia sets and so on. And it is related to the fact that if you look at complex maps of the form Z is mapped to AZ plus B over CZ plus D, this is again very closely related to these continued fractions and uh, also this operation that appears in the fairy tree. All right, so that's it for today. I plan to talk about 
this topic here, synchronization Arnold talks later on. I hope you enjoyed the lecture. Thanks a lot for watching. I hope to see you again. Take care. Bye.